knowledge out of it. Today, we have Peter Mullen as our keynote speaker. Yay, Peter, um, who I am happy to introduce and have been an admirer and follower of work for several years. Um, he is going to speak today on making architecture in public, making architecture in public, aspiration, collaboration, perspiration, persistence, and a joy. So as the president today, I'm Camille Job, president of the AIA chapter, and uh, happy to welcome everybody. Um, Peter is now serving as the chief of architecture and urban design at the Austin Transit Partnership and has been a really good friend to the AIA for many, many years. Before we get on to Peter's speech, I'd like to introduce our sponsor, our keynote sponsor for today. Uh, we have Crystal Myers from Anderson Windows and Doors, and their support for this conference makes all of this possible. So please welcome Crystal up here for a few brief words. All right. Thank you very much. We do have a couple of slides, um, and they're going to put them up real quickly. And. First, you can go to the next slide. First, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Crystal Myers. Um, I'm with Anderson. I've been with them for about three years. I actually live in Northern California, and I support the Austin area virtually. And um, I'm thankful to be here. And thank you guys for being present and excited to see the keynote speakers and your guys' breakout room. So if you have any questions today, please stop by. And I'd love to introduce myself to you guys and get to know you. And I'll introduce Katie now. Hey y'all, I'm Katie Keating. I'm a territory sales representative for Anderson Windows and Doors. I live here in Austin, Texas, and I cover the central and south Texas market. Um, I've been in the industry for 18 years. Uh, I've only been with Anderson for one year, but I have grown to love Anderson and everything that we represent. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Okay, why Anderson? Because of our vision and values. Our vision is to make the world a better place by living up to our promise that everyone benefits from using Anderson. Our values make Anderson who we are. Integrity, innovation, excellence, partnership, and corporate citizenship. Next slide, please. Within our value of corporate citizenship, we are invested into producing sustainable products for the home. Our long-lasting products help to meet Green building standards for energy efficiency, waste reduction, and healthier indoor air quality. We are constantly striving to find ways to make our products as green as possible. Um, please come over and visit us, and we uh, would love to tell you more about Anderson. All right, and we would like to introduce um, our keynote speaker today. So next will be Peter Mullen. Here you go. <laughs> Thank you, I'm just gonna say a couple more words about Peter before he comes up here. Um, he brings decades of experience of working on public space design and community engagement to Austin Transit Partnership. He believes Project Connect is an extraordinary opportunity to reinforce and enhance Austin's diverse and human-centered urban fabric. So a lot of you probably know Peter. He comes with a lot of experience with some very interesting projects in his background, highly involved the High Line in New York, after that, he came and he worked on the Waterloo Greenway with us for many years and got that thing off the ground, including the big awesome park that we have, which is a uh, center for cultural exhibits and performances. Um, I'm guessing everyone here has experienced the Creek Show at some point or another. I clearly remember the last one before the pandemic where the lines were sort of up and down, up and down, up and down the road. Peter was there shaking everybody's hand as they went into the Creek. Um, he's just a good advocate for Austin and all the things that we love about this place so much. So um, a few other things that Peter has done. Uh, he graduated from both Princeton and Yale University. He uh, received the Alpha Rho Chi Medal for Leadership, and thank goodness we have him here with us to help grow Austin um, to the beautiful cultural place we all envision it to be. So, Peter, come tell us what you're up to these days. Um, 
I don't have the clicker, so I don't know who does. There's a missing clicker out there. This is a great slide, but I think it's probably, you're probably more interested in what comes next. It's disappeared. Oh, here. Um, so, Camille, thank you so much for that nice introduction. I have to say, it made me a little nervous, and um, you know, I, I don't usually get nervous speaking about work, but um, this is a crowd that I really care what you all think. Um, and um, so anyway, it's really exciting to be here. Ingrid, thank you for um, inviting me. Ingrid, you all are so lucky to have Ingrid. She is just, um, she is the best in so many ways. Um, so thank you. And it's great to see so many old friends now, oldish friends uh, in person. Um, so I'm gonna go through a little bit of a journey here. Um, so I'm a lifelong New Yorker. So this, this story is a little bit of a conversion story. Um, so I'm a lifelong New Yorker. Um, this was, you know, before I can move to Austin, this is kind of how I saw the world, right? Um, literally, you know, the world ended at the Hudson River. Um, you know, when you live on the, you know, surface of the sun or the center of the universe, why would you want to go anywhere else? Um, but the reality is, is that, you know, we have found an incredible um, life here in Austin. Austin is incredible. And even though now I've been here long enough so I can complain about it, like good Austinites do, um, and it was much better five years ago, of course, um, I will say it's a really special place. I really try not to take it for granted. So um, I think the other part of the conversion is also a conversion about how I see the process of making architecture. Um, you know, architects are trained or used to be trained, maybe it's changing, um, to really be, it's about command and control, right? Control all the elements, you know, lay it out, figure it out, give it to people. Um, that is not how we make, can make public architecture in the present, and I think we're much better for it to have a much more collaborative process. I will say, I slip into command and control occasionally, because it's, it's hardwired, it's baked into me, but, um, I think, I, I hope that I've learned to see a much broader, more inclusive way of, of making work. Um, so, um, the other thing is, just again, a few framing slides, right? So, um, one of my favorite El Arroyo signs of the last uh, couple of years, um, we are in crisis, folks. Like, socially, it's a mess out there, I think. And I think in Austin, sometimes we, because there's so much prosperity here and all of you are so busy that we forget how bad things have gotten on a number of levels, environmentally. Um, we saw, had some good news recently about that. Um, certainly in terms of our racial equity, income equity, um, it's, you know, we got real problems and I think architects need to be really part of the solution. I think architecture can be part of the solution, um, and certainly in the way that we work, the way that we think. Um, so I think that's something we always have to remember and keep in mind. Um, so the other framing things, this is hard. This is hard work. We're, fight, we're, we're pushing boulders uphill. Um, this, you know, this was a picture, um, actually my wife took a couple days ago. Um, and it's, but it's a symbol, like it's, it's hard work, but progress is possible, right? Um, nature finds a way. I think we can find a way if we're managed to find the little gaps in the cracks um, of all this, you know, difficulty um, to make things better and to improve our community. Um, and lastly, you know, I think uh, it's gonna take all of us, right? And I wanna make sure I say a few things up front. The work that I'm gonna share today is not mine, right? I mean, I've had the good fortune of working with incredibly talented designers, architects, landscape architects, engineers, et cetera. This is really their work, and I'm gonna try to call out the people responsible for it along the way. Um, if I forget anybody, right, from any, in any perspective or any, on any level, Please let Ingrid know. I want to be accountable for that, seriously. So let Ingrid know, she'll tell me, and then I can apologize, right? And, and remember for the next time. Seriously, we need to be accountable to give credit where credit is due. But look, it's going to take a team to do this work. It has always taken a team, and, and I want to make sure that those, those team members are recognized. Um, okay, so three chapters to the story. The first, um, the High Line in New York. Um, uh, how many people have been to the High Line? Okay, great. So. Um, 
you know, the High Line is this little strip of green now on the west side of Manhattan. Um, you know, it's good to see it in the context of the whole island because I think when we started this process, it was very much an edge, and now it's become a center um, for better and for worse. Um, you know, it has this uh, really interesting history, uh, short industrial lifespan um, built to carry freight on the west side of Manhattan. Um, interestingly, the, the rail line, elevated rail line, was built, you know, inboard of the, str of the block. Right, so instead of running down the street, they bought all this property 100 feet in from, from 10th Avenue. And um, which, you know, because at the time they were tearing down elevated subways, right, at the same time that they built the High Line for freight. Um, so it was, you know, but it's part of what made it this kind of hidden uh, element in the urban fabric. Um, and so when, you know, in the late 90s, there was an effort to tear it down. Um, and a couple of local community members, Robert Hammond and Joshua David, discovered this, right? There was this, this secret garden up in the, you know, 30 feet in the air, running behind the block. Um, and uh, they thought there was a better thing, to, way to go than to tear it down. Um, and so we worked with the city of New York to create a new public park. It is a New York City park uh, that runs for a mile and a half from Gansevoort Street in the Mickey Packing District up to the Convention Center at 34th Street. Um, and I think has completely changed the way that that part of the city functions and is um, understood and imagined and used. Um, and it has had some impact, I think, on how we see public space generally. Um, it started as an advocacy effort, right? So um, the initial reaction on the part of almost everybody was it will never work. Like you'll never get this done. It's a terrible idea. Elevated public spaces don't work. Um, you know, Rudy, who at the time was, you know, admired. Um, I don't remember that, America's mayor. Um, you know, he, you know he, he was aligned with all the real estate interests that thought that was a terrible idea. So the first thing we had to do is basically sue the city of New York to, to keep it from being torn down um, and fight some pretty well-funded uh, opponents in that. Um, and so there was actually this great um, sort of anti-propaganda campaign um, that describing all the reasons why the High Line was a bad idea. Um, What's interesting is I spent a lot of my time, so I was at the High Line from 2004. I started as a volunteer in 2001, then I was there on staff 2004 to 2015. Um, you know, we had gotten the first section built in 2009. The third section, right, was still unprotected, and it took us another six years, even after the success of the opening of the High Line, to convince the related companies who were developing Hudson Yards that it was worth preserving the High Line. So, you know, the advocacy doesn't end, even after the initial wins. You got to keep going. Um, you know, and in the end, right, the elected saw the light, right? And I love this, I love this picture because nobody's looking at one another, right? They're all, you know, posing out into the distance, um, and some of these folks are still still with us, still um, doing good stuff. Um, but really the thing that sold it to a lot of people was the economic benefit, right? Um, that, you know, the investment by the city of New York, this $100 million, $123 million investment, um, would pay dividends in terms of additional tax revenue, right? So it was originally, it was an economic development argument. And part of that was timing, right? So this is in the early 2000s, after 9-11, City of New York is in budget crisis, $5 billion budget deficit after 9-11. You know, questionable whether cities would survive, right? Which in retrospect seems crazy to imagine, but they're like, are anybody, is anybody gonna go into a tall building again, um, you know, after 9-11? So they were looking for reasons to, ways to invigorate the, the urban fabric. And I think one of the things that happened is that, you know, we were too successful, right? And so, for those of you who've been there recently, you've seen what's happened. I mean, this incredible property, real estate boom around the High Line. I mean, the, the, the income to the city is phenomenal, right? Like one sixth of the, of the entire Parks Department budget is basically funded by the incremental tax revenue generated around the High Line. I mean, it's, it's insane. Um, but I think we've also seen the negative impacts of that, right? Um, a lot of people don't think that the High Line is for them because it's surrounded by high-end condominiums. Um, the condominium developers have, have used the High Line as 
the identity of their developments, right? So it's associated with those. Um, this ad on the right is one of my favorites. Um, and again, these are the same developers that didn't want to preserve the High Line at the rail yards, which is interesting. Um, but they don't show the building, right? They don't show the design of their building, they show the High Line. So by association, you know, the High Line was represented an idea that they wanted to be associated with. And I think that um, to Robert Hammond's credit and other staff and the board at, at Friends of the High Line, they've really doubled down to try to um, change that perception, right? And so, um, you know, to basically invest in the community, um, they have lots of programs for local teens and, and other ways to, to, to encourage the, the local community to make it their own. Um, design was always a really integral part of the process. The first thing that, that we did was do an ideas competition just to get people's juices flowing. This was the winning entry, which was a mile-long swimming pool. Um, there are 700 entries, right, including this great hippie, I don't know what, um, you know, and then some, some kind of dark, you know, dark visions of what the Highline could be. Um, so lots of really, I mean, it was a great way. The design community was heavily engaged in this whole process and really, really was the engine for advancing it. Um, and then the design competition in 2004, which was won by uh, James Corner Field Operations and Diller Scafidio and Renfro, working with Pete Udolph um, and others in the room, right? Uh, so, um, and they, you know, they put together this really, really clear vision for the, the how to adapt the structure for the future and yet try to preserve some of the elements that had captivated people's imagination as a ruin. Um, and so creating this kind of modular system of, of paving that could incorporate aspects of nature kind of pushing its way through, like that lily pu pushing through the, the side crack in the sidewalk and creating this variety of different environments. Um, it, the early renderings had this kind of sort of pseudo dystopian kind of view, you know, um, where New York was still on the verge of being successful or being or failing, um, you know, again in this kind of uh, post-industrial landscape on the west side of New York, um, and the Highland was kind of inserted into that and enjoying that in a way, um, you know. Uh, they're really great influences. I think I always think these images are like inspired by Super Studio, you know, from the 60s, you know, where you've got, you know, naked children in decaying urban environments. Um, somehow that's, you know, that works. Um, you know, there are ideas that didn't come to fruition, right? So this was a swimming pool over 14th Street that was somehow combined with a wetland and a beach, um, you know, with no railings, um, you know, uh, that then converted to an ice rink and a ski slope. Um, so, but I think all these, all these really creative ideas were instrumental in the process. And then um, there's always this tension between the human aspects of it. And so this is a really, really cool diagram how the human activities would grow and diversify over time. And that kind of mirrored also the, the biodiversification of the, of the natural landscape. And so there's always this fragile um, balance between nature and the human condition. And I think that's really at the heart of the, of the idea of the place and part of what makes it work is that balance. Um, and, uh, you know, so this is, again, the team, you see Rick Scavidio, James Corner behind him. That's our, actually our board chair, Phil Aaron's off to the right, you know, always keeping his distance. Um, anyway, but they also, you know, I will say, healthy amount of creative tension on that team, right? And so it, they actually created this diagram showing how the, the members of the team, which included, you know, Pete Udolph, the amazing Dutch plantsman, Bureau Happold and structural engineering, um, observatoire on lighting, that they're all kind of eating each other, right? And, and, but then feeding each other back into this kind of weird design ecosystem. Um, but it, you know, it really worked because that creative tension, I think, created a lot of, of positive energy and I think something that I've always tried to actually continue to promote on design teams that I've worked with and, and keep it healthy. Um, so again, the, this is the original vision. This is what got built. So pretty close, right? I mean, we stayed pretty faithful and I think having that clear vision at the beginning really helped. Um, these are images from right after construction. The landscape has really, you know, taken off since then, obviously. Um, you know, immensely popular, uh, you know, I'm just going to go through these quickly. I think the, the, the interplay between the natural elements and the heavy industry of the infrastructure are part of what make it really work. Also, being aware of the city around you at all times, 
not necessarily in it, but aware of it. Um, it's a little bit like that sort of abstracted view of the city that you get on it. Um, that I always, I always thought was like a De Curico painting, right? That you, you, again, you see the city in a new way. So again, this perspective changing. Um, but it's always there, and that's part of what makes it really work, is that the, the diversity and the energy of the city is all around you, and you, feel, you partake in it. Um, um, these little fragments of the history, these kind of uh, graffiti and, and uh, old historic industrial lettering. Um, were, and then the, you know, part of what the organization started to do is to figure out how do we actually leverage this asset um, through programming and community engagement. And so um, we did these great communal uh, soup lunches, um, which, you know, sit down to people that you didn't know and so to really try to leverage the, the social aspect of the place. Um, Salsa night, which was something, an idea that came from the community um, and that we implemented, something they asked for and we were able to implement. Um, you know, parades, linear linear parks are great, right? Because they really lend themselves to processions, um, which, you know, you can do a lot with. Um, but then I think one of the things that really the real measure of success for me is are the, the unplanned activities and seeing, this is where the joy comes, right? So um, seeing how people just would engage the space in ways that we hadn't imagined or didn't program, um, because that that's really infinite, right? And, and continues to be. Um, you know, and so seeing, you know, kids so happy and their parents happy, right? Which is not that easy all the time to see parents and their kids happy at the same time. Um, you know, in romantic moments, um, I've had a lot of people write me about, you know, they, they propose to their spouse on the High Line. Um, I really, my, my dream is that someone will actually give birth on the High Line. Um, no one's taken me up on that yet, but you know, I did have somebody's water broke on the highline. Um, but you know, gotta get, gotta go, get all the way. Um, you know, and then just the diversity of activities, and again, it's it's a sort of a crystallization of the urban environment and all of its messy, you know, glory. Um, you know, people doing weird things. I don't know what this is. This is just a, like a random thing. Um, and then we, we started to learn from that. Like, how do we actually then create this feedback loop where we're creating environments that then promote that? So um, this was uh, right when we opened the second section and there was a parking lot adjacent to it that was going to be a development site, but it was vacant. So we used it to create a temporary roller rink in it, um, which somehow was the model of that was the Campidolio, the plan of the Campidolio. I don't know where that came from, but it was kind of fun. Um, so that's what it looked like, you know, before we started. Um, and that's what it looked like when we did the installation again just for the summer because we had this window where we could get in there but it was great because I think it was a part of town that people didn't know as a way to introduce the um, the, the place and also I think in, brought in people that wouldn't otherwise have come they came for the roller skating and then they discovered the highlight as a result and that's a theme I think that we can build on um, lots of great activity around it. Uh, this is the Standard Hotel, um, which at one point was the, the hottest, you know, uh, basically pictures of people exhibiting themselves in the Standard to people on the High Line was the hottest moving element on the, on the, on the internet. Um, you know, and then right when we opened the first section, um, this woman who lives in an adjacent tenement building who was a cabaret singer, um, she decided she was going to take advantage of all the new people that were in her vicinity. And so she actually put on this spontaneous performance every Thursday night. Um, she was terrible, um, but it was great because it was just, again, the city responding and engaging in dialogue with the public space and doing, so this kind of, the, the public space was inspiring activity around it. And I think that's something that, again, with, through design, we should try to encourage and promote. Okay. Um, Chapter two, Waterloo Greenway. First of all, got to point out, Melba Watley is here today. She is one of the founders of the Waller Creek Conservancy, which became the Waterloo Greenway of the Conservancy. <laughs> Much of what is here is really due to her and her, um, her vision, and we wouldn't definitely be here without her. So anyway, thank you, Melba. Um, you know, uh, linear park system on the east side of downtown, very, so many similarities, right? I mean, obviously different context, Austin, New York, but formerly industrial area that is uh, ripe for new development um, with a linear green space at the heart of it. Um, 
you know, this is partly about infrastructure, right, this story, right? So Walla Creek historically flooded and lots of bad things happened, people die. Um, the city builds a tunnel, which by the way, is working marvelously. Um, just, you know, the lot, not, not a very popular item for many years. Now nobody remembers how unpopular it was. It just works. So um, let's remember that when we have more unpopular discussions about infrastructure going forward. Um, you know, we will all forget, right, once they work. Um, you know, and so uh, again, the the vision for this again, not mine, right? So this came, you know, Melba's idea, crazy idea was that we were going to have an international design competition, um, first in Austin, first in Texas. I, anyway, big first. Um, you know, again, really great participation by great teams was won by Michael Van Valkenburg and Associates, and they created this. Um, this vision of a, a chain of parks, we don't use that word anymore so much, um, but a linear park system that, that combines the natural features of the creek and enhances them, um, of Waller Creek, um, but connects these park systems. And so it's on the one hand, it's about ecology um, and restoring and enhancing the ecology of Waller Creek, leveraging the tunnel to do that. Um, it's about mobility, about connecting places through this new mobility function through cycling and, and pedestrians and, and connecting to the rest of the pedestrian network um, uh, at the trail and the, the Shoal Creek Trail and Peace Park, et cetera. Um, and then creating a series of parks that can become destinations for people and gatherings and community. Um, you know, and these parks can both be solid places for solitary experiences of communing with nature, so much great in, uh, research in the actually the the biological benefits of being in nature it's a chemical we have positive chemical reactions the same way we do when we're having sex um, you know uh, also you know uh, you know places for gatherings and 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 this is symphony square which you know historically was we've gotten lots of stories how people this is the place to come downtown for many years before there were other amenities so creating those opportunities for people to come together uh, using public art as a way to stimulate people's perception and experience of the environment um, and doing that through partnership. So this is also about that opening up, right? We didn't do anything by ourselves. We did things with partners who brought their own expertise and imagination and insights. Um, and so, you know, really, in the, of course, instrumental to this partnership. Um, but I Weigh Ways Forever Bicycles, which um, unfortunately was only temporary, but I think was really uh, changed the way people saw that space. Um, and the Creek Show. Lots of people in this room have done installations. Thank you for that. Um, Ingrid has curated this for its entire history. I mean, unbelievable work. I also want to point out Meredith Boston, who's now back with the, in, in Austin, the IA, who shepherded this when she was the director of programming. There you are. Um, I mean, this is like the dream team. I'm so great to see them back together again. Um, uh, but, you know, Creek Show, again, when we didn't have a park and Waller Creek was a, not a very nice place to be, this is a way to actually sh show it in a new light. And again, I think, I assume most people have been to it. Um, just showing a few installations. This is Tension that was uh, done by Perkins and Will, which I think was interesting how these installations evolve over time. They, they start to have more social commentary, which I think is great. Um, light Lines by um, Cameron Campbell. Um, you know, and it's just great to see how people react. This is uh, uh, floating the waller, uh, Chrissy Tenike, um, and seeing how, kids in particular. Again, children. How do you inspire children to to discover their urban environment? Um, and then Water of the Park, which is the first phase that opened last year. I can't believe it's only been a year, but just almost a year ago exactly. Um, Twelve-acre park with the Moody Amphitheater at the center of it. Um, Tom Pfeiffer, the architect for the amphitheater. Um, we really worked hard to try to insert the amphitheater into the park so that it was integrated. It was a singular experience um, and so that the park would not feel forlorn and empty um, when not being programmed, um, but then could provide this uh, ability to support you know whole range of programs. So these are, I, I gotta get updated photos. These are from construction, but I wanna show it because it shows the architecture by itself and then show the difference when you get people into it. But, the whole structure is about how do you take advantage of the Texas light and, um, you know, make this something that is not a dark, forlorn, foreboding, empty place when not in use. Um, the stage designed to be accessible um, and inviting, so having steps and ramps that allow the public on there when it's not being programmed. Um, and then having a nighttime life as well. Um, 
Now, I will say, you know, the landscape has really taken off in the last year. And if you haven't been to the park recently, really, I encourage you to go because the landscape is just unbelievably beautiful. Um, and you can see even Trinity Street, how, how much it's grown up. Um, we're using the city's reclaimed water purple pipe system. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a good use of water, uh, but it's really supported the, the, the plant growth in the park um, as well as the design. So, I mean, it, it looks more mature than it deserves to at this point. Um, you know, and you really, I think when you get in there, you feel Again, similar to the High Line, both away from out of the city, surrounded by nature, but you're aware of the city around you. And obviously that's gonna change a lot as the city develops around it. Um, this is the Hill Country Garden on the southern end. Um, this is a constructed landscape, right? Much of what is there was brought in, including some very big trees. Um, and that's that tree in the back on the right. So the trees are doing really well. Um, uh, John Hillis. Has, is to thank for that, um, and not some small expense, but it's really worth it because I think it establishes a permanence to the place. Um, oh, I should say, all this landscape on the left, sorry, oh, it doesn't go back. Um, anyway, the landscape on the left is all on a roof garden. It's on top of the building, so which you wouldn't even notice. Um, the wetland in the southeast corner, again, is like an incredible attractor for birds and diverse ecosystem. Um, and then the north part of it, so this is upstream from the tunnel, uh, north, this is looking north from 14th Street. You know, this is an area which is a little bit of a pilot for what's going to come in future phases down by the lake and elsewhere on the creek, um, basically stabilizing the creek bed uh, through these kind of soft engineering solutions, um, you know, uh, with plantings and stumpery and other, other techniques. And that's what it looks like now. So, I mean, it's really working and, and doing its job. And so I think it's a great model for, for future work to come. The confluence, which is phase two, is going to be um, under construction, I think, starting at the end of this year, beginning of next year. So the social aspect of this, right? Waller Creek, Waterloo Greenway is at the fault line of a dividing line in our community ever since the 28 plan, right? So um, this is something that we need to acknowledge. We need to uh, honor um, in terms of the impacts that it's had on our community and then work to mitigate, right? So I think the Conservancy's mission is not just about building the park, it's about using that tool as a way to bring communities together. Um, you know, so using programming really intentionally, right? Both nature-based programming, again, through partnerships, um, but also going to programmers, right? Entities that are already embedded in their communities um, and actually trying to support them in their work. Um, and then the park becomes the beneficiary of that partnership as well, because um, those constituents become the park's constituents and then it starts to grow from there. Um, last year they did it, and they're doing it again this year, Dia de los Muertos Festival. Um, this is the Leberman Plaza, which was created a kind of a shrine to loved ones and family members. Um, you know, the recent uh, Friday night movies, um, you know, I can't remember what this program was, but again, try, you know, what's great about this space is that it's, it, it allows itself to, for, to, to support hybrid programs. So things that are not necessarily a concert or a festival, but could be a combination of both. Um, and then there's the, the, the paid programming through the sort of the contemporary music program. Um, and I will say that, you know, I was a little nervous about this and the impact on the park, like, you know, would it sully our pristine park? Um, the park basically can withstand it. The experience is amazing. And I think it's also a way to introduce the park to a whole new constituency that otherwise wouldn't know about it or know to go there at all. So been a huge success. And then now we're starting to see these kind of spontaneous, again, unplanned, unprogrammed activities. Um, this was from last weekend. Um, you know, somebody getting their quinceanera photos taken on the stage, right? And so I hope that this will grow over time. This is exactly what this space should be for, um, not just the things we plan, but the things we don't plan and that people bring to the space itself. Okay, chapter three, Project Connect. So um, the, okay, we're good. Um, so, you know, we, we, have a, we have a growth challenge in Austin. Um, you know, population's projected to double in the next 20 years. Um, the roads are not gonna double in the next 20 years, right? We are, we are hemmed in, 
And so, you know, we're going to have to change the way that we move around the city if we're going to be able to move at all. Um, so the city in 2019 passed the Austin Strategic Mobility Plan. Um, and really the, the main goal of this is how do we address that population growth and to, to have to support this mode shift. So instead of 75% of us driving by ourselves in cars, how do we provide other alternatives and options for people to move around, most of which are a lot more efficient. Um, bicycles are more efficient, walking certainly more efficient, transit is way more efficient, right? So um, that's where transit can, it comes in. Now you can see transit is like the, is the teal line. So it goes from very small, I think they're 4% of our population is commuting by transit right now. Um, actually, it's interesting, the Downtown Austin Alliance, Michelle is here. First of all, amazing partner, Waterloo Greenway. So, you know, thank you for that. Um, they, uh, they have a survey out right now um, looking at downtown. So please go to their website and take it. Actually, I don't know if it's the downtown Austin. It's, it's ATD's Austin Transportation Department's survey because um, they're looking at the core transportation plan. Anyway, one of the preliminary results on that survey is that 70% um, of people are now commuting to, to downtown via, you know, single applicants via vehicle. But in the future, 20% of them want to, and 70% of them want to take transit, right? So there is a desire for people to use transit and a need for people to use transit. Um, so 2020, I think we were successful at passing a, a, a referendum um, to fund this new great transit expansion. Um, and I just want to point out, this is a program of multiple projects. There are multiple elements to the, what the voters voted for. Um, there's enhancement of our local service. There are new metro rapid lines. Um, there are obviously new light rail lines, which are high capacity transit will carry a lot of people and become part of the backbone of the system. There are enhancements of pickup, which is the kind of the ride share on demand service that Cap Metro runs. Um, and importantly, at the bottom, you see um, there was $300 million for anti-displacement, recognizing that um, many of these improvements are going to have economic development impacts, some of which are not great, right, and that have made risk at displacing existing communities and existing businesses. And so creating a fund to basically offset that and mitigate those impacts. Um, I will say it is the first, I think, I know of, of its kind for a transportation referendum nationally. Everybody nationally in the, in the transit industry is looking at us and how that, that's one reason why they're looking at us because we're really trying to build in these equitable investments into our transit upfront. Um, so I think that's a learning, a bit of learning we've done over time and they're building into the program. Um, the other thing that's really innovative about the, the referendum is the delivery mechanism. At the same time that we voted to create a new funding stream, so it's not a bond, right, which is great, it's a tax in perpetuity, um, which will fund both capital and operating, and that actually will give us a lot of flexibility in terms of implementation over time, but also created a new entity, the Austin Transit Partnership, to manage the implementation of the program. Um, and I think recognizing that, you know, having a special delivery mechanism whose only focus is building this program is gonna be what's gonna help get it done and get it done right. Um, obviously in partnership with the city and with Cap Metro. So this three tri-party entity is moving this forward with Austin Transit Partnership leading the way and convening the community. Um, so yeah. Trains. Trains are coming into to Austin, and everybody loves trains. Um, I love trains. I'm sure you all do too. Um, so this is partly about trains, but it's trains are part of the network, right? And so we have to see them as part of the network, and a network that includes all modes, right? So it's bus, it's pickup, it's it's metro bike, um, it's pedestrian improvements, right? Um, somebody says, you know, the the one thing we know about transit is that everybody uses their their feet or their wheels to get to it, right? So it is inherently a multimodal um, system. Um, so, you know, we've got to think about this in a holistic, again, human-centric way. Um, and really thinking about all users, not just the able-bodied users, but um, particularly those who might be mobility impaired or disabled. Um, because if we design for them, we design for everybody. And so that is kind of a first principle for us as we use throughout our design process. And we've already seen how it has informed the design process. Um, and so we're really trying to um, look at the program through this 
broad holistic urban design lens. So this is an opportunity for us to really reimagine, reshape our public realm to serve the public broadly. Um, so looking at sidewalks, looking at bike lanes, looking at street trees. Um, again, you, we want people to get to the transit and they, the, that way to get to the transit has to be desirable and attractive and you can't, you, you don't want to think you're going to expire as you get to the transit. So um, building in that sort of first and last mile infrastructure to facilitate um, the transit system. And it's really, it's part of the transit's business case. We have to build a culture of using transit. We don't have that yet here and we need to build that. Um, and that's how this is going to be successful. So few of the, I just want to focus on a couple of areas where we've tried to bring that urban design lens and put it at scene in relief. Um, again, this is all very preliminary. This is not designed. I do want to call out, you know, we're working with two big engineering firms, AECOM and HNTB. They've done the preliminary engineering on the two light rail lines. But um, one of the things that I did when I joined ATP was I put together a little design uh, SWAT team um, that was kind of on the owner's side to help sort of facilitate and, and, and the process and also bring this, enhance this urban design lens. So um, uh, McCann Adams is part of that, Janet McCann, uh, Jim Adams and Randall Matsuno, um, office of Michael Shu. Um, so uh, Jeff Clark is leading that for their office. Um, DWG Landscape Architects, obviously a huge part of this. Um, Eric Schultz is leading the effort um, with Robert Infanger and Tiffany Price, and also Asker Robinson, who's been facilitating with a lot of our community engagement. So um, that team has been really helpful at sort of bringing this new uh, urban design lens to the program. So this, uh, this station at Pleasant Valley and Riverside is at the intersection of the Blue Line light rail and one of the new Metro Rapid lines in purple. And um, so it's a great multimodal connection opportunity. Again, light rail doesn't go everywhere. It's part of a network. So making, taking advantage of these nodes where multiple modes come together. Um, it's an area that's in pretty dramatic transformation. A um, lot of new development happening around it. Um, this is an intersection that does not feel very pedestrian friendly right now or very urban. It's more of a highway. I mean, we have a Texas U in the center of the urban area. So one of the things we have to do is not do that, right? Let's do less of that um, and make things more pedestrian friendly. Um, we also have a lot of topography on the site, which has been a huge challenge. Trains don't like to be on a slope. They want to be on flat surface. Pedestrians also do better on flat surfaces, right? Especially if you're mobility impaired. So how do we create some flat surfaces to facilitate all these movements, both trains and people, um, has been a huge challenge and informed the design process. Also, what's happening around us? So we've got uh, Country Club Creek and the Country Club Creek Trail uh, directly to the east that connects to the Butler Trail and the lake. Um, and we have this space in the median of, of Riverside where we could actually develop public space and also achieve some of our environmental goals. So um, looking at the design for how to do that. We started out with two different options, went to the community with them. One was the, the Blue Line underpass option, which was a grade separated option where Riverside, sorry, Pleasant Valley, which is running north-south on this map, um, would continue through the site and the blue line would run underneath and there would be a station kind of centered on the intersection. Um, all those ramps you see are what it takes to make that station accessible. Not ideal, right? Um, you can see how that works in section. Um, so we came up with another option, which was to try to actually create, to really focus on the pedestrian connection and that large median and actually divert the traffic around the median. Um, and you can see the, the pink is a d dedicated bus lane um, with a dedicated bus stop um, adjacent to the, uh, the light rail station. Um, so great connectivity, multimodal, but honestly not great for traffic. And one thing we have to acknowledge, we're not gonna get rid of people in cars. Like we have to accommodate them, we have to make it work. So really not great for traffic. So we were working this as hard as we could for a long time. And then at some point we had to say, all right, stop. We need to go back. Like, let's look, what else can we think of? Um, and so we, we came up with this idea of actually moving Riverside Drive completely, right? And regrading the site entirely. Um, and what that did was it basically gave us a much bigger, flatter space where we could allow the traffic to move through, 
right, in a, in a rational way, um, create a space for multimodal connectivity between bus and rail, the bus continuing perpendicular north-south on, on Pleasant Valley, that's the metro, metro rapid line, and also have space to create some visit public amenities to support the station and attract people to this place. Um, and I will say, one of the other benefits, sorry, oh, I can't go back, Dang. Anyway, those white spaces that we created when we moved the road, that's new real estate. What can we do with that real estate? So how do we think about TODs and ETODs? I'll talk about that in a second. Um, this is, uh, this, so this is an early rendering of the station again. This is not designed. This is just to give people an idea about what the possibilities are um, and trying to, but I think one of the things that this points out when we started getting into actually imagining this, thinking about what the language of our, Austin's transit system is gonna be. What's the architectural language going to be? In many cities, the transit system is a defining element of the city's architectural heritage. We have the ability to create that, right? What is that? I think it's a really interesting, challenging problem, um, especially since we're kind of a new city, but I think it's a great opportunity as part of this process to, to create that. Um, but also having this very landscape focused approach. So um, actually building out as much of the, the open space as a, a water quality feature that the public can move through and enjoy. Um, it's kind of exciting to think about, I'm gonna arrive at the subway or the train walking through a garden, right? Like that is good for transit and it's good for people. Um, another area where we spend a lot of time is on the drag. Um, the orange line runs up uh, Guadalupe through the drag. Um, the drag, I think, is an underutilized resource right now. Um, iconic, one of the iconic spaces and places of our city. Um, COVID did not do it any, did not help it very much, but it does, it's challenged by this kind of nine month economy associated with the university. Um, a lot of business turnover. So how do we make this a place that is maybe a bit more pedestrian friendly that also enhances its, its iconic qualities? Um, it also happens to be a hugely uh, uh, activated, pedestrian activated space. So those blue lines are, are pedestrian um, counts at intersections along the drag. And you can say they dwarf even the busiest intersections downtown, right? So this is maybe the heavily, heaviest pedestrian um, activated place in the city. So how do we leverage that? Um, you know, we went out to the community. We asked them, we showed some things, showed some ideas, got some feedback. Um, one of the ideas was taking all vehicular traffic off of the drag, which, you know, I was kind of worried that I would, you know, people were gonna egg my house when I suggested that. Um, but there was a lot of interest in, a lot of support because especially among students, because students don't drive, they walk, right? Um, People don't drive to frequent businesses. They use their feet, right? Or they use their wheelchair, right? So there are lots of upsides to local businesses of this option. Um, so we're working on a, on a design for the drag that does um, an option that, that removes all vehicular traffic off of the drag, um, creates dedicated, um, what we're calling option lanes, which could be dedicated bike lanes or shared bus bike lanes. We're still doing some, some operational modeling on that. But again, have very generous spaces for pedestrians, segregated from bikes, um, adding new street trees on the west side of the street. This is a cross section looking north. Um, taking advantage of the street trees on the east side next to the university um, so that we can take something that looks like this, um, which is kind of an ad hoc accretion of elements um, and make it look more like this, right? Um, and taking this and making it look something like this. And again, I think part of the value of this is that adding some of these elements just shrinks the scale of the street, um, which I think will enhance its functionality and its um, desirability. Um, I will say that there's been mixed reaction to this, right? There are a lot of people that are freaking out about the, the no, not being able to drive. Um, some people who are like, I support transit all the way. Like, yes, I voted for it. You definitely, we need it. But I live in Hyde Park, and how am I gonna get where I wanna go, right? So, you know, we're, rubber's gonna hit the road here, and we're gonna have to have some tough conversations, and, and this is part of the process. We want it. Like, this is part of what we're trying to do is to surface all these issues, all these questions. Um, anyway, exciting opportunity. Um, and then the bridge over Lady Bird Lake, um, again, not designed, but just the reason I bring this up is because it was an area where we got a lot of feedback, right? Um, we were planning on a bridge that carried light rail and also pedestrians and bicycles, um, just shown here as two separate structures just for clarity, um, not, again, not designed. Um, 
there was a lot of interest in could this also carry buses because again that would enhance the transit functionality of this. My initial reaction was there's no way you're going to be able to fit that busway into this very constrained space, particularly on the north side of the lake, right? So I, I admit, initially I was like, this is never going to work, right? No way, no how. Try to put it down, right? Wouldn't go down, right? So this is the learning process, right? The community said, no, you gotta, you got to make this work. So we worked on it. And again, I give the, the folks at DWG worked this hard, working with the engineers at, at HNTB, and they made it work, right? So. Um, this, this is the north shore of the lake, and the, the plan currently is that the, the, the trains would cross the lake on a bridge and then go directly into a tunnel on the north side of the lake so that, again, that sort of limit the impacts of the train on the shore. Um, and the, you can see the, the pedestrian way would then reach the top of the bank. Um, that's on the left. Um, and then that's the option with the busway where the buses would essentially, when it gets to the, to the lake, would kind of fold on top of the trains. So it gets this very complicated section, but again, does it in a way where the trail can be continuous through this space. Um, we did have a, a, a scheme where the buses and the, the trail were coplanar. Um, that did not go over very well. Um, the runners were not very excited about that, so we've figured out a way to not have that. Um, again, this is a rendering of that first option and then the second option. So more structure, right? It's not as pristine, but again, lots of transit capacity. And these are two real options that then we can talk with the community about. Um, and I think that's part of this process is that it's a conversation, right? We don't come with one option. We come with multiple options and we talk about it. Um, now. Here's where the rubber's gonna hit, also hit the road for us. Costs are not what the, we thought they were gonna be, right? Um, we're seeing, you know, some of this is within our control, right? Design scope is, has gotten bigger, right? Adding buses to the bridge increases costs, for example, right? Um, but some things are out of our control. Real estate costs are through the roof. Inflation is unprecedented, at least in recent memory. Um, and these costs are not gonna, you know, we can expect them to continue to rise. So. We have to go through a process now to basically calibrate and align um, the program with our funding that we have available to us. And so that's what we're doing right now. Um, first things first, like we're gonna stick to the vision, right? We're gonna build the vision that the voters asked for and supported. Um, it may take us a little longer to do it, but we're gonna complete it, right? That's, that's not in question. Um, and it includes all these different elements, right? So it's important to, to remind people of all the elements that that vision included. Um, but we need to look at all aspects of the program and evaluate them and assess them to figure out how we do that. Because I think it will be different from the way that we've been thinking it would happen previously, just because of cost. So looking at the technical aspects of the program. Um, you know, the tunnel extents, that's one thing that's grown a lot and, in, and resulted in major cost increases. We have to revisit that. Um, you know, looking at, uh, you know, how do we cross the lake? Do we need two lake crossings? Can we get away with one? How does that change the alignment, right? We're going to look at all this stuff to see how we can optimize the program. Um, Part of this process also is, is looking at all these different, you know, honeycombs. With this, we're using this bee metaphor now. We're all busy bees looking at all these different elements. Um, but looking at, you know, where, who are we serving, right? How does the phasing work in terms of who we're serving? Um, how do we make sure we're serving priority communities, meaning people who need transit the most? Um, you know, where do they live? Where do they want to go? Um, so all of those aspects will then feed into our decision-making process that we work through with the community. And again, that's a big takeaway, right? This is not, we're not going to come up with a solution and hand it over on a platter. This is going to be a conversation, right? This is not our program. This is the community's program. Um, and I will say, I've come to a place where I now trust the process. I was one who didn't always trust the process. Now I, I feel like we had some wins with the process, and so I think we can continue to have wins with the process. If we frame the discussion right and present the facts in the right way and the right facts, the right decision will become self-evident, right? And so we have to have faith in that process and be transparent with the public and have that conversation openly and also be open to things that we haven't thought about, right? And that is something that we've done in the past and been successful with and will continue to do going forward. So, um, you know, I will just say, so this is, you know, we're in a city building collectively in this room, right? We are participating in a city building moment, right? It's not just Project Connect, it's I-35, 
Um, it's Peace Park, it's the rest of Waterloo Greenway, it's the Butler Trail improvements, um, it's the corridor program. Um, there's so many aspects of our city that are in play, the Innovation District, um, and we have the opportunity to really make this work and do it right. So let's do it right. You all are on the, the front lines of that activity. So really, if you're not on board and motivated and committed to doing it right, we will fail. So you are a crucial part of this. And the flip side is, let's remember who we're doing it for, right? It's not for us, it's for our children, it's for our grandchildren, and it's for all of our grandchildren, right? Um, so let's make sure that we keep humans at the center of this, even as we approach really hard conversations, um, and let's make sure we're making them in the right way. So um, thank you for your time, I really appreciate it. We're kind of running up against time, but. That's okay, thank yeah. you. That was, um, that was great. I think we were all familiar with the High Line and um, of course Waterloo, but it's great to hear all those connective pieces from you. So thank you so much. So happy to be our first live keynote in so long. This was great. I wanna thank also uh, Anderson Windows and Doors keynote sponsor. I want to thank all of our other sponsors and encourage everybody to go talk to everyone who is here in our exhibit halls. These guys are what make our conference possible and we they are our partners in all of this. Also the staff who has done an incredibly patient and amazing job especially this morning when everything has not gone perfectly smoothly. Have a great conference everybody. Thank you.